Hello everyone, today is August 31st and this is session number one of the Wake of Trading course part one. Um, this is probably cycle number th close to the 30th, so this is the 30th time that I would be teaching a whole semester um, of Wake of Knowledge. Um, so you can imagine that we've been you know, trying to perfect this uh, curriculum for quite some time. Uh, for those of you who are going to sign up, uh, go to our website, wikeofanalytics.com, find Wike of Trading Course Part 1, because we have two parts, or just contact us at wikeofassociates at gmail.com. If you have any questions, if you have any administrative questions, there is a discounted pricing that's still going on until the end of today, until maybe tomorrow morning. So for those of you who's going to register, um, $9.98 for the whole course, 15 sessions, or if you are an alumni of this course, then you could uh, uh, sign up again for $700. We do have payment plans for recurring monthly payments of $250. Um, seems to be like a very popular feature right now. Um, so. Uh, please make sure that you find this on our website on that WTC page and sign up like this. Under the class details, uh, 15 sessions going into December 7th. Uh, we meet on Mondays from 3 to 5 uh, p uh, five thirty p.m. Pacific time. And sometimes for those of you already who know me as a teacher and you've been my student, you guys know that sometimes we go over right, because there is a lot of material. I feel sometimes that we need to finish something that is logical, so, um, and therefore, you know, sometimes we go uh, 2.45, even sometimes three hours. Can you guys hear me? I have some comments that uh, some people cannot hear me. Can you hear me well? Yes, okay, so for those of you who are experiencing some audio problems, then, log off and log back in and that should solve it at least that would be the first step to do so we'll talk about the homework submissions already there are a bunch of students who are attending this particular session so uh, the homework that you're gonna have today is to read a specific article we'll talk about this in in a second and uh, once we're gonna have the homework and for each class you're gonna have a homework Yes, it's definitely um, uh, it's definitely a classroom environment. It's definitely not something where you uh, you know just listen in. Although we do have different ways of participating. Somebody might not even attend the live class because you might be in Europe, you might be in Asia. So uh, definitely all of our sessions, and here is that class, uh, here is that question, will the recorded material be shared uh, with those who participate in the class? Absolutely. So each uh, uh, Monday we upload the video and we also upload the slides and we upload the homework. And whenever you can get to that, you know, as long as you send your homework before the next class, I'll be able to go through your homework. Uh, and uh, uh, quickly comment, and then we would do the homework review during the class session. Uh, this class is interactive class. What does it mean? It means that students participate in discussions. So I'm going to be asking somebody to volunteer, not today, but in the second, third session, we're going to start uh, that practice. So make sure for those of you who are students who signed up or who is going to sign up, make sure that you have a microphone. Um, and we'll go through a bunch of exercises during the class where um, I'm going to be talking to you and we're going to go through the analysis together and I'm going to give you a, a live feedback. And as I mentioned before, all of the recordings and slides will be available to paid students. Um, the slides from this session, again, uh, only to the paid students. For those of you who are just here observing and enjoying this presentation, please do so, um, but we will not have the slides for you. As usual, uh, everything that we go through in our classes uh, is for educational purposes. Please stop the recording and read the disclaimer. What are we gonna do today uh, specifically. All right, so we started with the introduction, then 
Um, I'm going to talk about the homework that's going to be June's Forte Anatomy of the Trading Range uh, article that uh, all of the students. Uh, it's a mandatory reading, so I want you to read that. I'll explain later on why. Then we're going to go really quickly through market updates. This is the segment that uh, I've installed into all of our classes, or except for the specials, just because the analysis is so crucial, and just for you guys to see how the analysis evolves, how we are applying our white coffee and thinking in our white coffee and uh, labeling. Um, so uh, each class would have some portion of the market update. We'll go through the curriculum. I want you to know what exactly we will be studying uh, during this semester. Then we'll talk about Richard D. Wyckoff himself, who he was, what he did, why we're so grateful to him, and what kind of uh, knowledge he created for us. Throughout this presentation, I will be showing you real trades, the trades that I've put on um, in the last semester or so. Uh, one of them is going to be uh, a trade on Spotify, one of them is going to be silver, and one of them is going to be Novadir. For those of you who's going to be saying, well, he's showing only, you know, profitable trades. Yeah, I'm kind of sick and tired of showing not profitable trades where I made a lot of mistakes. And those you can find in the anatomy of the trade on our YouTube channel, which is called Wyke of Trading Method YouTube channel. Um, so there is a whole series that I conduct with one of our students and contributors, Franz. Um, and we talk about our mistakes in trades. Um, and usually anatomy of the trade is all about post analysis and how we analyze our mistakes, what kind of conclusions we make out of those, and so on and so forth. It's very valuable for those of you who are very serious traders and for those of you who are trying to establish the process. And we talk with Franz about the process. But today, I'm going to show you only successful trades. Well, can you blame me? Uh, I definitely want to show the benefit of the uh, of the methodology. We'll talk about the heuristic that Wyckoff called composite operator. This is one of the most important heuristics and tools, um, belief tools that we're going to use in our analysis. And obviously, this is just a heuristic, and we will have to convert it into what we see on the charts. And today, I'm going to show you exactly how we would do that. And then we're going to go into probably one of my favorite subjects, behavioral market analysis. So if you know behavioral finance, those are the studies of um, herd behaviors, individual behaviors. So in a way, we're kind of adopting that concept and we're combining it with the charting. So our goal with the behavioral market analysis is to understand who the market participants are, uh, how do they behave in different parts of the price cycle, and how could we see their footsteps uh, on the chart itself? So therefore, we're going to go through the price cycle itself. We will identify who are strong hands and weak hands. Uh, we'll talk about institutional hands against the retail traders. Um, and we'll combine it into the description of all market participants. Or we'll talk about different systematic approaches that people use in the marketplace and then we'll do a quick case study on different time frames on apple and then if time allows and i know that there is you know quite a lot of questions as to well did you identify uh COVID decline to which degree have you identified the reversal at the bottom and so on and so forth so the answer to those two questions is yes and yes, and I will show you exactly what was tweeted out at the time when the reversals were happening. All right, again, just to repeat so that we wouldn't be ask, uh, answering this question many times, this session is being recorded. For those of you who cannot go through the whole session, you will find this video on the Wyckoff Trading method youtube channel tonight uh, probably two or three hours after the session and for those of you who are thinking about signing up on uh, go to our website wikeofanalytics.com find the wike of trading course part one or just email us at wike of associates at gmail.com all right let's move forward here is the homework so for those of you who are already students in this class this is your first assignment. 
And this is not assignment where you're gonna label things. I want you to read what I consider probably the most prolific article on price structural analysis that was written by a student of uh, Hank Pruden, Jim Forte. Jim Forte um, was writing this article as a uh, MTA Series 3 exam. Uh, and I remember Jim and I, we were in the same classroom at, at that time. Um, and it's just a great, uh, great work, great synopsis uh, of what exactly the logic behind is each like a phase of the trading range, how the trading range unfolds, what would we uh, be looking in terms of the characteristics of the price and the volume behaviors. Um, it's 12 pages long, so it's quite a long uh, read, but it's very, very important for us to start with this article. This out article will be available to you on the access page uh, and all of the instructions how to access the page where all of the videos and the slides and the homeworks are going to be stored for you will be sent out tonight um, so if you don't receive this please contact us at wycoffassociates at gmail.com nancy is our um, uh, uh, chief operating officer she will guide you through the process of the uh, login and accessing those materials also, for those of you who are not familiar with our company, wikofanalytics.com, I would urge you to sign up for the Wyke of Analytics weekly newsletter. What do we cover? Well, uh, each week we're giving you some kind of market update. And this is just a uh, quick overview uh, of what we think is happening right now. And this is for those people who are not actively involved in any of the classes. If you would like to uh, receive a much more thorough analysis uh, of the current market environment, Wyckoff Market Discussion Class, which I conduct together with Bruce Frazier, each Wednesday at 3 p.m. Pacific would be the way to go. And uh, usually we would um, discuss the markets. We would go through the top-down approach, looking at the sectors, groups, stocks, and we would discuss also different, uh, different charts that either sent by students, by any contributors. Um, and, you know, uh, we have the different segments like scanning. Uh, uh, we have the segment on anatomy of the trade. So those are real trades that are being traded each week, uh, Wednesday to Wednesday, and we analyze those. So there are quite a few segments there. But also in the newsletter, Check out the uh, latest videos that we put out each week. Um, something comes out each week from us, either uh, a power charting episode or anatomy of the trade. Uh, each week, uh, our students compose a communal week of watch list. This is the list that is created by students and is for students. And it's a free product, so you could just check it out. Um, a lot of our students prefer to have that list for their weekly selection process. Uh, so therefore, you know, uh, we decided to create that list and do it on a weekly basis. Uh, also, quite a few blogs that we have, check those out. We have the blogs on the Wike of Crypto. Uh, we have Bruce's blog, uh, Power Charting, uh, which is just a stock charts blog. Uh, John Colucci. Um, is uh, writing on the Wyke of Structural Scanning. And I mentioned fronts already, so those are anatomy of the trade blog. So check it out and sign up. And you can sign up on wikeofanalytics.com. Now let's talk about the market update. So where are we um, in the price cycle? Are we at the point where we should be expecting the reversal? Well, let's go through all of the four indices first. So this is S&P, NASDAQ, Russell, and the Dow, and those are E-mini futures. As you could see, I'm not uh, showing the whole trend here. I'm showing the latest part. But since the uh, last meaningful consolidation, which we would label as a reaccumulation consolidation, we've been in this steady uptrend. And 
uh, we see some kind of acceleration of this uptrend after we overcame this high. There was just a pause where a sign of strength showed out and the backing up action happened. And then after that, somewhere here was an all time high. We overcame that and look how nicely in a very tight formation, the price showed that there's gonna be a continuation. Supply did not increase, so that was a very positive sign. And we are still in the major up channel where the price is just basically inside um, and uh, it's accelerating into the overbought condition. So um, 3,500 was, uh, was looking like a very natural point of the resistance. And we are stopping here a little bit. We have some supply that is coming in, um, but even with that supply, we're still holding here. So it's gonna be very interesting to see whether this could be a resistance or whether we're gonna continue to the upside. If you are, um, and you should be, um, uh, you know, be exposed. Uh, uh, if not fully, then in a where, uh, very big way uh, to the market through different, you know, instruments. And, you know, uh, you could be in the ETFs, you could be in stocks. So what's the strategy here when we are close to the old bot condition or when we are having a climactic run? Think about your stop losses. Uh, think also about potential hedge strategies. You know, if you see something where you see the reversal, uh, that could potentially uh, bring a reaction of maybe five to ten percent. Then you definitely want to, you know, consider some kind of kind of hedges. But so far, long-term uh, secular trend is up. Cyclical trend is up. And for the S&P 500, short term trend is up as well. NASDAQ is a little bit more in an overbought condition than S&P. And we could see that, you know, we are uh, overthrowing here, or at least attempting, attempting to overthrow. And supply did come a couple of days ago, a couple of trading days ago. So our expectation is that there's gonna be some kind of stop in action here, or, if we're gonna accelerate, then the next reaction is gonna be even more meaningful. Um, the Dow is kind of in the same position. So hitting like S&P 500, that medium uh, uh, medium up channel line, uh, which represents a resistance. But as it has done before, that those type of touches only meant some kind of pause. So would we pause here or would we just, you know, uh, have a more meaningful reaction? And obviously in all of the cases and even in the Ross, uh, in the case of Russell, and with Russell, we're seeing that the short term trend is actually a trading range. It was all of those cases when we would be talking in the classroom environment about trends and how behavior changes. And how do we actually see that? We will need to see some kind of reversal first and then continuation of that price uh, drop as a reaction that would break a significant uh, support levels. And usually that type of compromising price action where we see that the price temporarily commits below the area of the support and acts as a sign of weakness. And then inability of the price to go up in a significant way would suggest a change of behavior and then a more structural change, a change of character and could bring us to two points or to rather a, a change in regime. One of them could be a trading range and then the other one could be some kind of more meaningful reaction. And that's obviously, you know, just scenarios. And this is what we are discussing a lot in our analysis and in our classrooms. How do we build possible scenarios uh, as how the price could potentially unfold? So when it happens mentally, we are not um, surprised and we're just following one of the scenarios that is a possibility. So we'll still, we'll have to see how it's gonna go.
Let's look at the S&P in more details. As I mentioned, we are at the all-time high. And look at this uh, uptrend channel. The price is just touching that medium. Um, so in a lot of cases, uh, we could see some kind of continuation, especially into the climactic run. And that's why I'm open to all of the possibilities. Could we have more of the continuation and could we climax even more? That would be very interesting. Or would we just kind of like stop at this point and have some kind of reaction? Uh, so either of those scenarios, you know, uh, will show us what kind of continuation we're going to have. If we're going to have more of the climactic run, then as I mentioned before, the next reaction could be very significant and probably in line of what we have had in, Jan in June, but maybe even more significant if we're expecting uh, that the price after the all-time high created a major sign of strength and now we are testing this area. That would be a very logical thing to do for the price, especially thinking about the election and how we should go into some kind of pause before the election. Um, if we are just going to react here, then I would be thinking, you know, uh, what is going to happen around the areas of the support? Would the price stop there? Or would uh, the traders find some kind of support there? So we'll have to see. Uh, on the PNF, and it's not that we're going to discuss the PNF during the part one. We're just going to concentrate on a lot of other things that are more important than PNF horizontal count. But here I'm just showing you how we would use that. And um, on uh, we have quite a few material on the PNF, uh, whether this is a complementary material on our YouTube channel. So go check this out. Or we have, you know, three series that Bruce and I have recorded um, on the PNF. I would definitely recommend you to go and read his blog, uh, Power Charting on Stock Charts, where he talks a lot about the PNF. So what do we see with the horizontal targets? Well, first of all, just the rise itself, the trend itself, how we are fulfilling those small accounts and look at how all of those targets are coming exactly or somewhat close into the area of where the intermediate move um, concludes and then we have some kind of reaction and a trading range. Conclusion of the move, reaction, and then a trading range. So we are in that area again. We are in the overbought area um, where we are touching the um, extremes where we might be potentially overthrowing as well. And then some long-term targets are showing the same area. So whenever we are in the target area, what do we do as Wyckoffians? We stop, listen, um, and we watch what the price is showing us. If there is some kind of reversal in this area, that would be an indication to us that you know the potential upswing is done, at least intermediate upswing, and we could expect some kind of reaction that could lead to the new short-term environment like a trading range or more meaningful trading range. Having said this, what's interesting about this whole formation right here, and I'm using a one hour uh, PNF um, uh, scaling here, is that we do have some larger counts. And there is a much larger count that could extend the uptrend to higher prices. Having said this, even though we see more potential, um, uh, more fuel in the tank, as we say, it doesn't mean that the uptrend is just going to go up and up and up and up. As you guys know, the uptrends go up, stop, change behavior, go into short-term consolidation, and then resume the uptrend. And that happens because uh, strong hands, institutional hands, when those reactions happen, what do they do? They still have the conviction of the major secular cyclical uptrend, and they use those short-term uh, consolidations and reactionary uh, moments to buy more. And that's what consumes the supply and pushes the price higher. 
and we'll talk about this today and during the course. So therefore, our conclusions about uh, the trend is it's still uptrend until it's not. We need to see some kind of uh, more meaningful reversal and it might happen tomorrow. We might have a big day down tomorrow um, if we're failing today and tomorrow. So it could happen really fast. Uh, if we are close to that overbought condition, actually, we are already in that overbought condition on some of the indices. Therefore, we are somewhat vulnerable to a reaction, which is a very logical thing to happen at this point, um, unless we're going to have a continuation of that climactic run. And we have larger uh, counts confirming continuation of this secular uptrend. Let's look at NASDAQ. So this is uh, PNF, um, and again, I'm using the PNF here because it just shows the trend a little bit better, but uh, more importantly, it shows the causality and the idea of the cause and effect is just so crucial in of work. We need to understand that it takes time for institutions to accumulate um, during the uh, areas of the deeply oversold conditions. And obviously during the COVID, it didn't require a lot of time. It just took a week uh, or two weeks to create this type of causality. But you usually don't see that with that quick accumulation, uh, a lot of the details of the trading range. And here it is. And a lot of students you know, were asking me at the time, well, where do you see the trading range? Well, go to the PNF uh, chart and you will see a lot of consolidations or go to the uh, uh, intraday chart, uh, maybe like five minutes and you will see a lot of volatility right there. And what does it say? You know, the, all of these horizontal counts, what do they say uh, to us? Do we have more room to run? Yes. So we have a mega count uh, that is extending from the backing up action to the preliminary support. And this is a very logical count line for us when these two points are being observed on the same line. Uh, so it just confirms to us the correctness um, of the line that we are taking here. And then again, as we go up, as we are uptrending, look at how small accounts are confirming uh, the stop in action and the change of environment, temporary change of environment. Again, stop in, reaction, and then change of environment. Stop in, reaction, change of environment. We are currently in that zone, 12,600, 12,100. This is where we would be expecting that stop in action. It is in overbought condition, so this is a perfect place for us to stop. But at the same time, we are recognizing that there could be a slightly higher target, so we'll be on the lookout for any type of climactic runs that will bring us to the extreme overbought condition. Speaking about you know stocks and uh, uh, how we actually go through the selection. I mean, obviously we discuss a lot the market itself, but then the next step for us is how do we participate? Do we participate in the ETFs of the market uh, or do we actually choose specific stocks? I did mention a communal like of watch list. This is the list that is being created by our students. We definitely create this list, um, Bruce and I, and we go through that list once it's created. There are specific guidelines that we use in the creation of that list. We want to see a long-term causality. We want to see the emergence of the price action, which would tell us that an uptrend is emerging. And we also want to observe the emergence of the institutional presence through the relative strength. And um, I just did this uh, relative rotation graph on stock charts. This is actually a very cool feature there. And you could see the composition of the, of the whole portfolio. And we, we had, I believe, uh, almost 200 stocks last week. Um, you know, so it's a big list. It's not your concentrated 10 to 20 stocks list. It's a, a usually over 100 stocks list. And you could see how a lot of them uh, in yellow color here 
I actually go in from a lead into the weakening position. And all that also tells me that, you know, somewhere, somehow we're somewhat close, you know, to a potential stop in action. So a very interesting view here. So um, go to our website. You can download the symbols if you're using something then stock charts. You could also just quickly go to stock charts from that page. Check it out. It's very cool. All right, let's talk about the curriculum, especially for those of you guys who are going to be either taking this class or already signed up for this class. We're going to have 15 sessions. The last sessions, uh, the last session is always Q&A. So there are quite a lot of questions during the course that you have. And I will tell you exactly how we will deal with those. You're welcome to send me questions. And if appropriate, you know, uh, for the material, I will definitely insert it here and there and we'll answer those. Um, if the question is, let's say, about the material that is ahead, I will let you know and, you know, you could ask that question when we cover that material. Uh, but on session number 15, uh, it's all going to be about your uh, questions and my answers. So we'll go through that. The first four to six sessions, and actually I need to correct this a little bit. Yeah, this is not that correct. So. Uh, the first uh, probably six sessions uh, or five sessions, we're going to devote to the market structural analysis. This is our first understanding of Wyckoff concepts. How do we look at the price movement? How do we actually identify when the change of behavior and the change of character happens? And we go from one environment into another. Uh, as we go into the trading range, then we will be identifying different Wyckoff events that are going to be tied, uh, tied up uh, to different Wyckoff phases. Wyckoff phases is going to uh, show us some kind of timing uh, as to when the price potentially should leave the trading range. Then in the next segment, we're going to concentrate on supply and demand and for those of you who would like to do a lot of tape reading this is it this is that uh, you know segment of knowledge that we will cover and we will have a, what I call a systematic exercise where we apply in both the market structural analysis and tape reading based on the supply and demand and obviously we'll talk a lot about different volume characteristics in different phases of the trading range and how you know uh, the price and volume should behave. We'll talk about the most important Wyckoff of law of effort versus result. The change in the effort uh, that produces a change in some kind of result. And we'll talk about different variations as to uh, with the specific effort, what kind of result would we be expecting? And if it doesn't come as that desirable result, what does it mean? So um, a lot of tape reading techniques will also go bar by bar. Um, we also will discuss swing by swing analysis. Those are all parts of the tape reading. Uh, I mentioned the volume patterns in different like of phases. And also we'll talk about some uh, analogs that we could use on the charts to identify the strength of the effort or the the actual result so this is again probably you know some of the uh, most intense uh, training that we have um, in the curriculum itself and you know tape reading is uh, my favorite subject or one of the favorite subjects so i spend a lot of time developing those concepts and actually practicing myself uh, so this is always a fun, uh, uh, fun sessions. Relative and comparative analysis is going to follow the tape rating. And this is something that a lot of you already know, but we're going to give you our wake of perspective on that. Uh, we'll talk about the basics first. We'll show you some proprietary techniques that we use um, on the outperformance. And then we'll talk about filtering and scanning what exactly we are looking for uh, in order for us to select certain um, stocks or ETFs. Um, only one session will be devoted on the execution and this is intentional. Why? Because 
in uh, Wyckoff course, trading course part two, which we call the practicum. This subject, uh, we go into such depth and we talk about the entries and exit points, stop losses and how we move them. Um, uh, how do we scale in and out of the positions and so on and so forth. Um, so uh, WTC2, and I'll go through that um, uh, in this session as well through the, through the curriculum of, of the practicum, is for those students who will choose to continue your studies. Um, and I would say that, wow, this semester we have quite a few of those alumni students, uh, so thank you for joining us. Again, really quickly for those who are now thinking, yeah, this is definitely something that I would like to study. This is systematic. This is the homework that I want. Um, so I want to do exactly, you know, this course. Sign up today before the price changes uh, for 15 sessions, 998. If you are an alumni, 700. And you also could do the payment plan for, uh, for payments off to 50. Let's talk about Richard D. Wyckoff himself, who he was, and um, why is it that we are paying such a big attention to what he codified for us? Well, uh, we have quite a lot of material on, you know, the biography of Wyckoff himself. I want to point your attention to such a beautiful uh, five-part article that was written by Stella uh, Atsober, um, and uh, she is a CMT, uh, and she published this article in Stocks and Commodities magazine. By the way, there was a second article where I believe that she was talking about Wyckoff and Jesse Livermore. So this is a fascinating read if you just want to know about Wyckoff himself and what he was going through. Um, and also, we've invited Stella uh, to our annual Best of Wyckoff conference. It was in 2019, uh, a year ago um, in August. You can find her presentation on our website. She also uh, had an opportunity to talk to Bruce. Uh, so in the Power Charting episodes, you can find uh, her interview with him. Well, Wyckoff was, uh, started his career really early on as, uh, as a boy, you know, he was, um, he has grown uh, from that position into um, an editor of the magazine of Wall Street. He was also an editor of uh, different other publications. They had newsletter, they had uh, the magazine, and quite a lot of ways of reaching out people. And uh, probably if I would be comparing him uh, to any contemporary uh, market advisors, I, you know, uh, uh, William O'Neill comes to mind in the way how the business was conducted and how it was constructed. Uh, at some point of time, like I've had over 200,000 subscribers to his uh, services. So you can imagine, in the uh, early of last century, that was a very significant number. Uh, so why is it, you know, that people were paying so much attention to him? Well, because uh, he was uh, one of the first uh, or one of the main, one of the top five um, men in technical analysis at that time. And that was the time when the technical analysis started to have a lot of uh, validation by uh, retail people and also by institutional people as well. And uh, what Wyckoff have, uh, have, have done, uh, um, uh, Wyckoff and his associates have done, is that um, they've had an opportunity to observe and interview a lot of the stock operators um, and market operators of that time. So obviously Jesse Livingmore and Wyckoff was uh, an acquaintance and a friend to Jesse and they had quite a few conversations. So a lot of the techniques that Wyckoff put into his course came uh, you know, exactly from Jesse um, and then some other uh, stock and uh, 
market operators of the time, Wyckoff observed how they conduct the campaign. Um, uh, and the campaigns at that time were somewhat different than the campaigns um, that institutions are conducting in our days. Uh, there was almost like uh, a desire to distribute the stocks and they were given the supply of the stocks by the owners of the company uh, for the further distribution and they had to find the correct market environment. They had to accumulate the shares um, you know, for the control of the supply in the correct way. So um, uh, it's definitely, uh, you know, a very interesting way of exploring how the market works. And the biggest question here that I get from students is, well, it, you know, he did this a hundred years ago. Does it work right now? You're talking about the stock operators, and now, in our days, those are institutions with so much more hustle around them legislatively, they just can't operate in the same way because it's not allowed anymore. But as a herd mentality, as institutions are getting the same research, having the same type of intentions, having the same type of um, goals for their uh, trading, they are exhibiting the same behaviors. And as they do so, they actually, you know, being combined into this composite operator, smart money. And we could see their footsteps on the charts. And this is the main idea behind this course and the main idea behind the whole curriculum that we have at Wyckoff Analytics that started back then with Hank Pruden at Golden Gate University to study the charts in such way that we would be able to see the footsteps of smart money of big size institutional commitments and as they are usually more correct than incorrect we want to follow them um, and we want to write the trend together with them kent is saying you know uh, a comment from kent here linda rashke says that uh richard d uh wyckoff is her all-time hero to technical analysis um yeah i would agree with that well obviously he is my hero uh, although you know if we would look at those top five at that time um, the Dow um, Edwards and McGee uh, Gann uh, Elliott so all of them were you know uh, influenced technical analysis in quite significant way and by the way for those of you who uh, would like to listen to Linda's presentation you know go to her website and also on our website uh, in on-demand products we have a uh, couple of uh, specials with her. Well, as I mentioned, Wyckoff was a prolific writer and he wanted to deliver the message of what he saw in the market to his students. And he's done this in so many ways. One of the earliest um, uh, magazines uh, that he was uh, publishing was The Ticker. And here you could see that in 1909, um, William Gann was one of the people who was interviewed by Wyckoff himself. They had a newsletter that was uh, published regularly and then obviously the magazine of Wall Street that stopped uh, existing, um, I believe, after 1974 uh, when uh, uh, Wyckoff's family decided to discontinue this publication as it was unprofitable at that time. Wyckoff lost the control of this publication to his uh, second wife. Um, and unfortunately, uh, you know, he, he died, uh, he passed away in 1934, not having a lot of possessions, you know, that he accumulated at that, that time just because of that unfortunate divorce. Talk about the bad trade, right? So, uh, I, I guess, you know, a lot of you, you know, could relate to this. And also, he published quite a lot of books. Um, the question that I get from students, should I read the books? Well, if you are the beginner, then my um, advice is always to concentrate on more updated material first. So read Hank's book, read uh, Bruce's blogs, read... Uh, David Weiss's book, uh, take our course, watch our YouTube videos, all of that will bring you up to speed much faster. And then once you are an intermediate student, 
then go a little bit deeper and start reading actual Wyckoff material because it's somewhat outdated and it needs, you know, a little bit better understanding uh, of the basic concepts. This is the uh, original Wyckoff course, and um, this is probably a point where I should be saying that we are so grateful that before his death uh, in 1934, he was able to put everything together uh, into this course. So this is in the uh, public domain right now. You could also find it on the SMI website, so go check this out. Uh, in uh, the practicum, we will be studying actually this course uh, this semester. We will be reading it together. So with more advanced students, we uh, throughout the semester we read a book, um, you know, based on Wyckoff studies, and this is going to be our um, uh, reading material for for the practicum this semester. I would urge you to upload this, you know, find it, um, and. Uh, 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 you know, study it, uh, if, especially if you have already uh, spent some time studying Wyckoff but have not had the chance, you know, to go through the original course. All right, our first anatomy of the trade. This is very exciting, so uh, let me explain to you what was happening here. Uh, this is Spotify. Uh, it's um, the in the internet industry group and uh, this is an IPO in 2018. So think about the market, how in 2018 we had the stop in action and then kind of the trading range throughout. Um, so if somebody would ask me, how did I execute this trade? You know, what were the like of requirements for this trade to happen? And um, I would say that first we need to understand that. Uh, there is some kind of um, correct outperformance that the stock is starting to show. Why would that performance uh, happen? Because institutional buyers are seeing some kind of future value at the much higher price, and they start building their positions. It takes some time, and as they take time to build that position, uh, and they start building it somewhere here at the point of the climactic action where the price finally stops from uh, going down and then uh, that buy-in uh, absorbs the supply and that pushes the price up. It produces a change of behavior that suggests to us that we are in the different regime, in the different environment, in the trading range. And once we understand that we are in the trading range, this is where we go into the Wyckoff phase analysis. And phase analysis is basically telling us whether the stock is ready to move up or it's not ready to move up. Um, and we're going through different phases, phase A, B, C, D, and E. Those phases are gonna have different intentions behind them. Phase A is gonna be all about stopping action. Stopping action of what? Stopping of the previous trend. Phase B is all going to be about building up the causality and how supply and demand interacts with each other. Phase C is going to be the last testing point for uh, the tests at the level of the support. And then if the price recovers and starts marking up throughout the whole trading range, phase D is going to be the initial markup phase for us. And in this case, we are seeing that outperformance. I'm using the relative strength ratio line right here. You could see how uh, the um, relative strength is uh, starting to have higher highs, higher lows. It resides more above the moving average. And this is where we want to uh, capture the stock um, and figure out whether structurally the stock is already at the correct place. So my initial points of entry, and I'm just um, identifying to you different areas of where uh, the um, points of entry have happened. Uh, but, you know, stylistically, my trading is all about scaling in, scaling out. So I want to scale into the position and I want the position to show me that it's working. And therefore, I'm going to be building my size gradually. Uh, 
but in this case actually you know scaling uh happened you know quite quick so uh, one position here here then it was really nicely done in this area where position size was increased um a lot and the reason why is because the character with which the price has moved showed a lot of momentum and suggested a lot of momentum as a continuation so therefore when you see that momentum signature and the increase of that momentum signature you want to uh be a little bit more aggressive with your scales in and that's exactly what happened and then after that there were two more add-ons and now it seems like we are uh, somewhat you know close to the highest points highest closes that we have been we are in the established uptrend and hopefully there's going to be a continuation uh, above 300 by the way it's not only that I'm scaling in I'm also scaling out taking some profits making sure that um, the trade makes sense um, on paper and you know in terms of how portfolio be behaves so there were two scales out uh, on this bar right here at around 250 and then on this bar this was just perfectly timed uh, uh, close to 300 so those were two uh, small scale outs that I used uh, in this particular position all right let's talk about the composite operator what is this heuristic and I'm bringing to your attention something that um, I found in the magazine of Wall Street and I was so excited when I saw this this is an article that is called The Composite Man. It is uh, He Who Makes the Market by Richard D. Wyckoff himself. Um, and um, I, you know, like a year ago, I started showing this to students. Why? Because there is a whole history about how we've learned about Wyckoff. The way how I was taught uh, about the composite man and the composite operator is that you have institutions and you also have uh, retail traders. And at that time, you know, 100 years ago, I think this was more, uh, this was more profound. This was more accurate. Uh, what we're seeing in the current marketplace is that uh, the trends are just being created by institutions. The retail people, unless those are IBD subscribers, or unless they are maybe some Robin Hood traders that you know are following the same trade, uh, we don't see a lot of retail traders influencing the market. Um, so, therefore, our definition of the composite man is slightly different and i'm so happy that i found this piece that talks about not just composite man being you know uh, always right so somebody um, might say well warren buffett is the composite man yeah absolutely but not on all trades that's very important distinction there sometimes he's wrong and he's not acting as smart money and there are quite a few trades where he's wrong just the most recent trade was in airlines where he exited on the way down during the uh, uh, market decline. And then, uh, you know, he didn't get it back in. Uh, and Sorry about that, guys. Just... Uh a break a small break here so let's just go through what he wrote here who is the composite man and where can we uh, can he be found so just follow what he uh, has written here he consists of some two million personalities scattered over face of the earth so this means that at that point of time this was you know the body of traders around the world that would you know make their bets in the market some of his components parts are richer more powerful than others so here is this reference to uh smart money you know institutional money uh the uh, the institutions that would have a lot of power with a lot of uh equity that they put in the market some are noted for their foresight intuition shrewdness conservatism so these are you know analysts um, you know, somebody who might be conducting campaigns on a smaller scale, some for dash and daring, reckless quality of their moves. So those are going to be our speculators. 
uh, and professional traders. Uh, these millions of personalities form one omniscient who sways the market. So this is the composite man, you know, um, a herd of traders who are correct on the uh, direction of the market, crushing those who do not know and will not learn to benefit by him and crowning with profits and income those who do. So therefore, even at his time, I think Wyckoff was recognizing that the biggest composite man is not just one stock operator. It's not just one institution. Uh, it's going to be a collection of institutions and traders who are going to have a big size and knowledge. I'm gradually losing my voice and we're still at the beginning of the session. Wow. All right, so um, maybe let's slow down a little bit. Well, at the time when Wyckoff was actively trading and uh, commenting, analyzing the markets, um, he was talking about the composite man uh, as stock operators man. And those were obviously were, you know, people like JP Morgan, James Keane, Jesse Livingmore. What are the methods or the intentions behind the composite man. Well, um, this is how Wyckoff described, you know, what the composite man does. In theory, he sits behind the scenes and manipulates stocks uh, to his advantage, uh, to your disadvantage, if you do not understand the game as he plays it. So, and maybe a, a lot of you here would kind of feel this way, right? With you put it on the position and then it just goes the wrong way and you always ask well what is going on what is happening is this the big money just seeing my orders seeing my stop losses um no the market doesn't really care about you the those institutions don't really care about you they might see some orders but they don't know exactly that you have placed that order so my answer to the well, I put the stop loss and it seems like every stop loss that I put in and it's being picked up, most likely you either run in the directionality of your trade or uh, you just, your placement of the stop loss is incorrect. And this is obviously something that we study a lot uh, in the classroom. The composite man carefully plans, executes and concludes his campaign. So there is a methodology uh, 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 with which the institutions approach the marketplace and they act in a specific way. A uh, composite man attracts the public to buy the stock uh, in which he has already accumulated a sizable line and that scaling in, scaling out, that's the style of the institutions. They're not going to go in and establish the position in one, in one trade. They're going to be uh, buying and selling continuously and they're going to be doing this at the specific spots where they either buying in the oversold conditions or they are selling in the extreme overbought conditions. Uh, and this price cycle just repeats over and over and over again. Guys, and I see some of the questions that you're posting. Please go ahead, post those. That's fine. Uh, if we have time, we'll definitely come back. Uh, what I would like to do is just to go through the whole material and then see if we have a chance to answer those. All right, let's talk about something else. Let's talk about the next step. Those of you who may be, uh, you know, intermediate traders but have not taken our first part, uh, part one of the Wake of Trading course, I just want you to know that uh, we have a continuation of this class. Uh, and uh, it's a part two, it's all about the execution. Uh, we practice a lot. I truly believe in practice. I don't like when people say that if you practice without the money, this is not 
a valid practice. I just right away kind of like understand what the person is or who the person is as a trader. Uh, it's important not just to understand the knowledge. It's important to develop a skill to recognize that knowledge on the chart. And just because I've been doing this for quite a long time, I could see how students sometimes they kind of, you know, try to absorb all of the knowledge, but without the practice, their results are somewhat limited. They could be right, they could be wrong. They could be right for some time, they could be wrong for some time. So there is no consistency. In part two, uh, which is the practicum, we are developing that consistency. We are applying the knowledge, we are doing this through the drills and exercises with the concentration on bias and timing. We talk a lot about the trading tactics and management. So what kind of price structural scenarios are possible here? What kind of trade management, therefore, we're going to have there? With that, risk management is going to come a lot into the uh, into that uh, uh, process and obviously you know uh, filtering you know this is something that uh, is extremely important at that level of understanding so we do a lot of that also uh, we have a lot of advanced like of uh, studies uh, even after the first course uh, on different phase behaviors on the variations of the volume signature on the trend itself this is just uh, extremely important uh, area you know to consider uh, not just opening the position and closing the position but how do we behave in the trade what do we do where do we add to the position how do we go through the reactions how do we go through the consolidations uh, we go through some of the historical examples and obviously we talk about modern TE tools and how do we combine those with our like of analysis for those of you who are interested in this course well first of all you still have to have a prerequisite part one um, and I no longer um, maybe like five years ago I made this decision I no longer accept any students into this level without them going through part one just because part one discusses some things that you just don't know um, and uh, you know we have to be on the same page in terms of semantics and in terms of understanding but uh, please go check this out uh, it's going to be a free webinar tomorrow at 3 p.m. Pacific. And uh, um, just check it out what we're going to do in that class. Also 15 sessions. Another anatomy of the trade. So uh, another current trade, uh, another trade that I'm still in just because of how the trade unfolded. This is silver, SLV, the ETF for silver. And I just wanted to show you that white coffee and trading range. Uh, and even today, somebody asked me over the email, you know, can you look at, uh, you know, this and identify the Wyckoff patterns? There are no Wyckoff patterns per se. There is just Wyckoff interpretation of the price structure. So Wyckoff should be able to, you know, interpret and to explain any type of, uh, you know, price and volume uh, uh, changes. So therefore, there is no specific Wyckoff pattern. Sometimes people refer to Wyckoff schematics, which we will be studying a lot in this class. Uh, but Wyckoff pattern is just the analysis itself. And we see how silver has been consolidating for quite some time, since 2015. So this is a big cause that has been built. And then obviously COVID reaction uh, uh, negates all of those gains that we have had on the rally prior to that. Now, I want to point your attention to this rally that came before uh, COVID reaction. Why is this rally so important? Well, because for the first time, it shows an ability to overcome some of the intermediate highs. That's number one. So that's very constructive. And it also happens on the increase in demand signature. So institutions were coming in into this position actually even before the pre-COVID uh, uh, the pre COVID trade. And then during uh, uh, COVID uh, reaction, we're seeing a source of funding in silver, in gold, in Bitcoin, in stocks, in bonds. Um, you know, this is a very typical way of how uh, the anatomy of the crash happens. And this is something that I'll be talking in one of the specials in, a, uh, in, uh, in fall. 
um, you know, we'll look into the history of different crashes, most recent crashes, and they all have, you know, very similar characteristics. So the points of entry here uh, were in these two areas. Why did they happen in those areas? Well, uh, the COVID reaction produced what we call a sprint. This is a temporary commitment below the area of the support with the quick recovery back. And usually it comes with some test in action uh, on higher lows and diminishing supply characteristics. And looking back at this whole causality, we would be thinking that yes, indeed, institutions already started participating in this theme in metals in general and in silver specifically. Gold has been going up for quite some time being in the uptrend and leading, and uh, silver being a speculative uh, metal usually follows gold later on. And this was the timing for us to recognize that uh, silver is going to start having more of the speculative run and speculative, uh, speculative way um, um, you know, of uh, showing the outperformance. And we see that uh, as definitely uh, outperform the market, that outperform the the gold itself, and I thought that these two points of entry actually were quite successful. And by again, by the points of entry, those are areas. So multiple entries uh, in each of the area, uh, and you know, for those of you who's going to be taking the classes, you can ask me this question, and I can show you in more details how that was done. And this trade is still on, this trade is still unfolding. Why is it still on, even though there were some uh, scale outs uh, on the way up? I believe these two places were uh, uh, small scale outs. Uh, why is it important uh, you know, to recognize that this trade will continue? Uh, and obviously I'm looking here for a long-term trade, and we usually would call those campaign trades. Those can last for some time. They could last a year, two, and even more. Uh, in this case, I don't know how long it's going to last, but the magnitude and the quickness of the advance and ability to overcome significant highs uh, suggest that there's going to be a continuation. We might have some kind of uh, a more meaningful prolonged trading range. That could be a possibility. but all of the PNF counts and the way how the price and volume behave suggest, you know, further up for further secular uh, upside, and this is what we would be waiting for uh, for silver. All right, let's talk about the behavioral market analysis, and our case study here is going to be on the price cycle. Here's our price cycle. Uh, this is a theoretical model, so we'll talk in theory first, and then I'll show you some examples. The main principles behind the price cycle is that it always repeats itself, and it has the same type of um, periods uh, under the observation uh, that would uh, be comprised of, first, an accumulation area. This is an area where there is an exchange of shares between strong hands and weak hands. And by strong hands and weak hands, I don't just mean institutions versus retail traders. I mean institutional traders against institutional traders. Strong institutional hands against weak institutional hands. And this is where in the downtrend, weak institutional hands and retail traders are going to be capitulating and a general capitulation will happen in this area. This will come with the stop in action, and that stop in action as a selling climax will be identifiable by us on the chart with um, uh, big volume spikes. And those big volume spikes are gonna show us that there is not only increase in the supply, but also increase in the demand. So somebody is buying. And that somebody is that smart money. And they are seeing this as a deeply oversold condition where they have a deep long-term value available to them. So they are willing to come in and establish that initial position. And because they observe the supply at that point, the price stops uh, from going further down. 
and then it reacts up. And that's how we are seeing that after this change of behavior, there is more buying and therefore the rally is much better. We are changing the regime from the downtrend in to a trading range. And once we're in the trading range, this is where our Wyckoffian you know, skills should shine because we want to identify different phases and therefore go through the whole trading range before we experience the last uh, test at the level of the support and then the last te test at the level of the resistance. And then that establishes the, uh, the, tr the uptrend. This is how the trend the uptrend emerges. And this is where um, other, you know, more momentum driven institutional traders are gonna come in and they're gonna establish the position right here. Actually, all of the trades that I've shown uh, to you so far, they come at that place, at the emergence of the uptrend. Um, so institutions, are, or rather their models, their systems that they use uh, have either uh, more of the value approach where they are picking up uh, stocks um, you know at the point of value or more of the emergence of the uptrend or, or the emergence of the trend type of uh, uh, model it and obviously some continuation and on the way up we're going to experience some areas of the reaccumulation where the price is going to stop and pause and uh, you know those pauses happen because as I've shown you in my trades, I would scale out uh, out of some of the profitable positions and that will produce some emergence of the supply, short-term supply, which could produce you know, a meaningful reaction and a change of the regime, uh, a temporary regime change uh, from let's say uptrend to a temporary consolidation with an idea that the uptrend will resume its course We'll stop at another area of the array accumulation and then go to the distributional area. So the second uh, part of the price cycle is the markup. And again, this is something that you know we are study, uh, studying a lot in the practical. Uh, why? Because our concentration usually for WTC1 cores is gonna be all about selection itself. What do we select to trade? We want to select something that will outperform the market and outperform the peers. And secondly, we want to understand where is our points of entry and where is our uh, points of exit. So this is WTC1. WTC2 is more about, well, how do we actually go through the trend? Where do we get out of the position? Where do we scale out? Where do we add to the position? Where do we recognize that it's no longer a stepping stone reaccumulation area, but maybe more the distributional area. So what does happen in the distributional area? Well, once the price goes to the overbought area, and this is based on the institutional modeling, they would be selling into the strength of the trend. And usually those are gonna be the value sellers the ones that picked up the stocks when it was extremely oversold, that will usually stop the price from moving further up and will create a more meaningful trading range. As we go through the trading range, a lot of the momentum uh, and trend followers uh, or following institutions, they're gonna recognize that there is no absolute gain or relative gain that they have during this consolidation and therefore they will start scaling out and they will start exiting the position. And this, air, uh, this action right here is gonna produce more volatility in the range, uh, is gonna produce more of the distributional qualities type of price movements and volume signature. And finally, it will start showing some cracks those cracks we're going to identify as sign of weaknesses, last point of supplies, and then the price is just going to go into the mark down. And this price cycle you can find on any of the time frames. You can find in any of the instruments where you have the price and volume signature. Uh, and we just are going to develop this model even more into more details. Here's an example of the price cycle, and this is a very long-term price cycle. This is Apple monthly chart. 
uh, and you could see how you know we might be thinking wow well was it really this causality that produced the secular move well if you would uh, take the pnf counts and we'll just uh, count from this point to this point right here it actually would just bring you to this uh, to this area right here so um, we would have to find the new pnf count uh, for the new cycle and we actually done this with students uh, so it works really nicely but just to think about the whole price cycle well first of all we have a secular causality here and we have a secular effect and apple is still very much so in this secular uptrend can you imagine i mean like it's been going on for 20 years this whole uptrend even more 25 years and it's still even high you know we're somewhere here at this point and then within the much larger secular uh, uh, price cycles we could find smaller cycles cyclical cycles so for instance this is an area where Steve Jobs announced that he's coming back so a lot of institutions are buying based on the management change and then look how they are buying next we could see that from the volume signature and I will show you how to identify that and together with the price movement that would act as a confirmation that institutions are finally interested in the stock and before, for almost a decade, they haven't been interested in this stock. So active accumulation on the way up, market takes the leadership stock down, and there is a lot of trend followers that are leaving this position at that point of time in two th at the end of 2000. And then the new uh, reaccumulation range or accumulation range, if you would like so, showing that there is not a lot of selling, and then once price that starts moving, this is where we want to enter this position and then on the way up we're going to have smaller price cycles right so even the movement in the reaccumulation uh, type of structural ways are going to identify those uh, price cycles that are just basically like going like this our goal as traders is to identify first original accumulation establish the position here and then identify all of the potential places where we could add to the position we also want as the white coffin to conduct a campaign meaning that we want to exit at the meaningful place that has a very logical explanation to us as to why we should be leaving our position at that point of time well who are market participants price market participants we've talked about you know uh different uh market participants i mentioned institutions i mentioned retail traders uh if we go a little bit more into the way of how they systematically look at the market and how they systematically interpret the market then we'll find that uh they have different int intentions and therefore those different intentions behave different uh, create different behaviors in the market and more importantly to us is to how do we actually identify their presence on the chart how could we say that strong institutional hands were present in this moment uh, in the structure and their intention was uh, you know to let's say absorb more of the supply and you know that's what pushed the price higher well, um, we first need to understand the logic behind, you know, their intentions and behind their uh, their goals and behaviors in the market. And we will be interpreting, you know, those intentions and behaviors from the point of view of strong hands versus weak hands. The strong hands is going to be any investor or trader who is trading in harmony with the price cycle movement. This is not the definition by Wyckoff himself. This is something that I've developed for the WTC course. Uh, the weak hands is going to be uh, the same, only they're going to be trading uh, in uh, disharmony with the price cycle movement. So if we would look uh, at you know where the strong hands are coming in and where the weak hands are giving up or coming in into the position, we're going to have a repeat behavior over and over in the price cycle where at the end of the distributional markdown we're going to have 
the extreme point of fear and capitulation by weak hands. They just can no longer sustain emotionally uh, being in this position. It's a significant loss for them. They just want to forget about it. They want to get out of this position and just be done with this. So uh, that's why uh, you know we are calling this in WTC course a general capitulation, the last capitulation where everybody uh, on the weak hands front just basically saying, I've had enough. This uh, anecdotally is going to be also the first place where we're going to see the signs of intelligent accumulation. It's almost like strong hands is a good psychologist because they uh, clearly recognize the climactic behavior, the irrational behavior by weak hands. Uh, that's what creates the uh, big momentum to the downside, a lot of volume. And uh, for big institutional hands, for those smart money, there are two types of requirements that we would have. They have to have uh, a big sizable positions. So a big size positions is one of their requirements. And the only time when they could actually create that big sizable position is at the time where there is a lot of uh, uh, liquidity available in the market, meaning that weak hands are easily giving up their position in bunches, and that creates the point of high liquidity. So that liquidity and uh, um, allows uh, to create big sizable position for institutions and they usually do so in the areas where the price is oversold and therefore there is some kind of long-term long value um, and that's what they're looking for they are acting as wholesalers they want to buy at the discount at the deep discount again think about like warren buffett and how he conducts you know his trading um, and they also want to buy a lot at that point of time and then as we go through the trading range, there will be some other points where, you know, in the structure, they will be willing to come in and to buy. And usually that's going to be at the bottom of the trading range. Um, and that's, again, what uh, how absorption happens. And by the time the trading range is done, those institutions have bought enough to absorb enough supply for the price to start moving in a different way. And once we have that, this is the area where, and I mentioned this, uh, where we have the emergence of a trend. This is where accumulation by early institutional trend adopters would happen. And usually those are going to be institutional trend followers, and it's going to be momentum type of institutional traders. And by the momentum, I'm not only thinking about short-term momentum, but I'm thinking about also long-term momentum as well. So <clears throat> as they are buying in, that produces more uh, momentum to the upside that uh, increases the price movement. And that is suggestive of the further continuation, obviously after some kind of pauses. At the same time, weak hands are so fed up trading uh, selling uh, uh, the reaction to the downside and then trading the trading range unsuccessfully that they totally give up their uh, positions and they become inactive. And I'm sure that a lot of you here in this group experience this type of behavior. It's very unconscious. And actually, in fact, you know, majority of our behaviors in the marketplace, as in life as well, are very much unconscious. And as a trader, it's your job to bring the awareness to the surface and be able, you know, to invest and to trade with, you know, a very heightened uh, level of self-awareness. As the markup concludes, we see the first sign of intelligent distribution by strong hands. We usually would see a lot of volume spikes, stop in action after the climactic runs, because this is where... Uh, an overbought, extreme overbought condition will be uh, observed by institutions, and they would be willing to sell because their valuation models are saying that the, uh, the stock is overvalued. At the same time, 
the weak hands not participating in the majority of the trend and starting participating only in the second part of the trend are going to be extremely excited and they're going to be still buyers and this is the only point where weak hands are actually profitable and as they are excited and they're buying in uh, that that produces the liquidity of, uh, enough liquidity for big institutional smart money hands to unload their supply into the weak hands and this is how distribution starts to happen I've mentioned that institutional trend followers during the distributional trading range are starting to scale out and to exit the position. That deteriorates the price and deteriorates uh, the volume signature as well. And um, that uh, starts uh, you know, uh, distribution on the way down by strong hands. At the same time, weak hands are still excited because they were making a lot of money on the way up they will be biased on those reactions that don't go anywhere or maybe result into some kind of up thrust action. They will also be buying on the breakout and then everything is gonna fail. And the reason why the price fails in the distributional areas is just because big hands have been distributing the stock and they are not buyers anymore. They are not scaling in, they're not support, supporting the positions and at the same time they're presenting the supply and uh, weak hands are giving up on their positions much faster. So deterioration of the distributional trading range happens much faster than the constructive uh, buildup of their accumulation that takes a long time you know, to absorb the supply. Well, this idealized schematic is showing, you know, that activity and inactivity by strong hands and weak hands. So we're seeing that strong institutional hands are going to be buying as the prices are falling. They also will be buying on the way up and then they will become inactive in the second part of the trading range. Some of these still will be trading and still will be scaling out, scaling in a little bit here, but they will be not as active as in the previous two periods. And then they will be sellers as the price goes into the extreme overbought conditions and they will be capitulating their positions really quickly once the markdown happens. And usually the markdown is going to be uh, uh, also shown to us on the chart through different phases of how uh, big institutions are capitulating out of that position. We will definitely look into this in uh, WTC uh, practical. Weak hands on the other hand are going to be having a different sequence. They will be sellers as the downtrend uh, finds the selling climax. They will be selling and buying throughout the trading range and then they will be exhausted to the point where uh, during the emergence of the uptrend, they will not even look at that stock. Or they will look, but they will not participate because of the emotional uh, pain that they've uh, had throughout the downtrend and the trading rate. And then once the uh, uptrend has been established for some time, they will become buyers, excited buyers, and therefore in the distributional range, they also will be buying some short-term value. Um, and then they will be capitulating on the way down. And this cycle just repeats over and over and over again. If you are finding yourself in this cycle, if you have the same behaviors, let's say uh, uh, of weak hands um, in the whole price cycle, you definitely want to correct that. One of the ways to correct that is just to align yourself with institutional thinking, institutional participation, and institutional behaviors in the marketplace. Um, therefore, you will have to adopt this belief that you know a composite operator, you know institutional smart money, are going to be correct on this position, and you want to identify on the charts uh, exactly where they are present. So for instance, right here on this Apple monthly chart, and we've seen this, 
uh, we are looking at the strong institutional hands behavior, and we're seeing that the volume signature has increased in 97 to 2000. Why did it increase? What has happened there? Are these retail people? Most likely not. Why? Well, because the volume signature is significant, and therefore uh, only big institutional money could create this type of volume signature. Well, what does the price do as this volume signature occurs? Well, the price is actually going up. Uh, what's the context of that price movement? Well, it comes out of the, you know, quite a prolonged trading range formation. So by combining all of these observations into deductions, we could figure out what is going on. Continue on with this analysis. A highest a low structurally with the lower supply signature um, confirms that there is not in, uh, enough selling to push the price even lower. And then the volume signature starts to increase and the price goes up. So what do institutions mean by this behavior? Well, they are buyers, and not only that, they are identifying this particular stock as the potential outperformer in the future, short term, long term, and therefore they are urgently getting into this position. If I would be, uh, uh, you know, kind of like reversing the way of thinking itself and the way how I was taught at Golden Gate University as to, you know, how accumulation happens. Accumulation doesn't necessarily happen only in the trading range. Accumulation does not happen in the trading range uh, throughout the whole trading range. There are so many variations that we would have to study as market students, like coffins, as to how accumulation or distribution unfolds. So, for instance, in this Apple example, we could see that there was really no accumulation here in this area. Uh, this was just dead in the water. Uh, when you know Steve Jobs, uh, you know, quit Apple, and he was forced uh, out of Apple. It's where institutions are finally excited about him coming back, the new product line. Um, this is where things starts to happen, and they are actively getting into, into a position. So we could see that actual accumulation has happened in the second part of the trading range, but not only uh, that. They believed in this stock so much that they were accumulating on the way up. This is all accumulation as well. And we could see this from the volume signature as well. Even on the next leg up, volume signature is somewhat high. It's comparable to the late 90s volume signature. So therefore, we would be assuming that even here, accumulation was happening on the way up. It's only when the volume signature went down significantly, that's when the majority of them became inactive. And even with that, you know, when we look at uh, some of the trading ranges and even, you know, uh, even the latest one, and um, I'll show you some of the trades in Apple, you know, that we had, um, they are not as active, but they are long-term holders. They're not presenting the supply into the market, and that's what allows the trend to sustain itself as there is not a uh, significant institutional selling. And this is the type of the chart analysis that we would do, but obviously we are gonna go into much, much, much more details. Here is the same stock, Apple, and now it's a weekly time frame, and we're observing the same type of the behavior. This is where uh, Steve Jobs came back, you know, uh, with the announcement, and we're seeing the trading range, this rally acts as a very uh, aggressive rally with a lot of buying. What does it mean? It means that institutions are actively getting into this position. Some value buying before that, and then obviously we're seeing how the volume signature increases, and this is what we would be looking for, for a sign of strength, backing up action, with its own trading range and with its own phase analysis. And we would be looking for those spots where we're seeing the conclusion in the, uh, of the downtrend in the beginning uh, of the upswing. Conclusion of the downtrend, beginning of the upswing. 
and we want to identify the zone where we would be extremely heavy buyers. And on the distributional side, as the price cycle unfolds, uh, it will have its own markup and it will have its own distribution. Uh, and here is that distribution. That particular distribution was not uh, favoring um, the market itself rather than the stock. So once the stock had this uh, decline, it went into the trading range where institutions still accumulated, uh, you know, uh, a lot. And here is another chart, uh, uh, but the same stock, two hours uh, time frame, and the same price cycle. And my idea here that I'm just repeating over and over is just for you guys to remember that the price cycle is going to repeat. The market uh, participants are going to behave in the price cycle in the same way, uh, whether they are value investors, whether they are momentum traders, whether they are trend followers, whether they are strong hand or weak hand, uh, behaviors will repeat because we as people do not change. We become either a better version or worst version of ourselves. But you know, if we don't work on our craft, uh, and by craft I mean investment uh, and trading, we will not be able to correct those behaviors. So in a way, WTC series, whether one or two and all other courses that we have, is basically all about changing the behavior, uh, changing your behaviors in the marketplace, uh, ident um, developing the ability to see on the chart something that you haven't seen before, ability to see that, uh, you know, like in this case, there is a lot of institutional volume signature that comes at the end of the move. So there is some bind behind it. And then we have a confirmation of this bind in the next rally and a pause. And there are quite a few places here. Here's the place number one, two, and even potentially three. And then as the price starts to deteriorate, again, recognition that the trend is done and that the new environment is on and we should be getting out on the background of price deterioration and volume deterioration. And I guess something that we will be studying a lot. Let's talk about different type of systems and methodologies that smart money, strong money uh, will be using. Well, and obviously we'll, we'll be mentioning some of the weak money as well, because there is really, you know, as I look at my own trading, as I look at the trading of the, let's say, hedge fund money managers that I consult, or, you know, my friends in the institutional world, um, on any, in any genuine trade, you could be a strong hand or a weak hand. Uh, you could be right, you could be wrong. Um, so uh, we're going to rotate. Our definition as traders is going to rotate from strong hands uh, to, uh, uh, to weak hands and back to strong hands. Well, uh, institutional contrarian investor, this is our first market participant. Those are value investors and they usually have a huge size. So again, think about Warren Buffett, you know, people like that. And their time horizon is secular and cyclical in nature. They are looking for the long-term value, short-term liquidity and contrarian sentiment. So COVID reaction was perfect for them to get back in and to the market in a more meaningful way and to hedge before the reaction. So their hedge, hedges worked out nicely and created the capital that they needed to invest at the lows. And then there was obviously a lot of short-term liquidity, a lot of long-term value, and a lot of contrarian sentiment. So that's how they operated in that uh, uh, period. And if we have time, I'll go through the anatomy of the COVID decline. Their limitations, is there a size? Uh, they always want to have low turnover of their portfolios and they always think about tax implications. Uh, so therefore their horizon is a little bit long-term. Uh, their edge is that long-term horizon because trends are much more sustainable um, on the longer time frame rather than on the short-term time frame. 
uh, long-term trends. Again, you know, exactly what I was talking about. And then a deep knowledge of the marketplace, you know, a deep knowledge of the history. They have a lot of analysts that work for them. So they come prepared. So, and this is your competition, by the way, you're competing against this type of guys. They are visible on the charts through the extreme volume signature, through the points of the liquidity, through the absolute and relative trends, and through the long-term volume signature. I think some examples, obviously the composite that operated, Warren Buffett, PIMCO, Blackcord, those are like the big boys um, that have a lot of, lot of money. Institutional trend followers are gonna be growth investors with the big size, with the cyclical time uh, orientation. They would be looking for the emergence of the trend. So their entries are all gonna be where the trend is starting to establish itself. Whereas the contrarian value investors are gonna be all about trading range and picking up the value there. Uh, and trend followers will be looking on their systems, on their models, the emergence of that trend. So, and this is us as well. This is where we want to come in into the position. We want to come in after the value investors had the chance to observe the supply and where the uh, uptrend is starting. And we want to come in together with the trend and momentum institutional followers. Their limitations is all going to be about the performance matrix. So think of them as money managers. And uh, money managers are, you know, uh, a unique uh, creatures in the marketplace because they will be dependent on their performance uh, matrix. Uh, their assets under management is going to depend on that. And it's basically for them either having a job or not having a job. So they will be uh, uh, looking for the places where potentially they can outperform and they can produce the absolute return as well. They're also concerned about the low turnover in their portfolio and tax applications as well. Their edge is the time horizon itself because it's cyclical in nature, long-term trends, and also deep knowledge. They are visible on the charts in the absolute relative trends, long-term volume signature, and momentum buying and selling. And those are going to be pension funds, insurance companies, investment banks, mutual funds, hedge funds, registered investors uh, advisors. Then we go to um, smaller traders, and uh, those are going to be professional traders. They are going to be orienting their systems to the momentum and mean reversion type of moves. Their size is going to be from small to medium. Their time horizon is going to be sometimes from intraday to daily swing trades. They are going to be looking for short-term overbought, uh, oversold, and short-term momentum signatures. Their limitations is going to be that they're going to have too many trades. High commission, well, that is going away. Uh, short-term taxation and a lower size. But their edge, and this is our edge, is that we are much quicker than institutions. And as I trade with institutions and consult with them, and I trade for myself and I see how students are trading, we are much quicker. I mean, the way how institutions are trading, it's almost like they're in the uh, in the 20th century, you know, like uh, th through all of the special brokers that they have and that just creates, you know, uh, there are so many cues, uh, uh, lines as to, you know, who sells first and so on and so forth. I don't know why, you know, they're not, really develop in a much quicker way, uh, you know, to, to trade, but that's what it is. And uh, it's definitely quickness is our edge. Uh, those professional traders are visible on the momentum buying and selling waves, short-term volume, short-term liquidity, short-term swings. They are either proprietary traders, retail traders, or registered investment advisors, smaller money managers also in that category. And then the last one, uh, is the retail trader. So usually momentum traders, small size, daily swings to the intraday, breakouts and points of excitement. And this is where you know retail is going to fail a lot. Um, the limitations, a lot is going to be, a lot of trading is going to be based on sentiment driven uh, behaviors. Uh, lower knowledge. So hopefully you guys recognize this and that's why you are here. 
uh, and low a skill. So obviously the same thing. We have to be knowledgeable. We have to understand how the market operates. We have to understand how institutions operate. And we have to go alongside with them. We are not as big and therefore we have to follow. But we need to develop that knowledge uh, to understand and to have the proper beliefs about the market. And we have to develop the skill to recognize their presence and the skill to execute those trades. Our edge, again, is quickness and different type of rules that we could create for ourselves. We are not that visible, you know, as retail uh, traders. In some spots we will be, but mostly we're not. And obviously that's all us. Uh, this schematic at the bottom is just showing the value investors, trend followers, momentum investors, selling by the value investors, and then capitulation by the trend followers and momentum traders. Let's look at the example of uh, you know those uh, contrarian and trend following institutions. This is Apple. This is daily chart 2011, 2012 into 2013 decline. So what do we see? We see that the volume signature increases throughout the trading range, which is acting as a reaccumulation stepping stone trading range. So what does this tell us? This tell us that institutions are still seeing value even at these higher prices. Please bear, uh, uh, please remember that this, the uh, uptrend has been uh, there for quite some time since 2003. So we've traveled for some time already and we went through the 2008, 2009 correction. So uh, it's always questionable you know, could the stock go higher? Well, if we're seeing that institutions are still absorbing shares at this uh, high level, then this is an indication that they are expecting the price to go up. As the price starts traveling up, we're seeing some momentum buyers coming in into this position, another trading range with value investors accumulating even more and just even based on that assumption alone thinking about how institutions are accumulating through the whole trading range and it's been going on for almost a year we are uh, absorbing a lot of supply during this year and that is suggestive of a quite a momentum run-up and then as that run-up starts to happen probably reminds you a little bit of the, you know, Tesla, you know, how it moves right now. We're seeing that trend followers and momentum traders are coming in. Into that uh, momentum, value investors that bought in at the lows are going to sell. We see that from the volume signature and how the price creates a change of behavior, suggesting that now we are in the trading range rather than in the, uh, uh, uptrend it still looks like an uptrend and this is where confusion comes for a lot of people higher highs higher lows but distribution has happened here and then distribution is happening in this area and it's our job as Wyckoffians to recognize that change of behavior to recognize that change of character based on the volume characteristics specifically increase of the supply increase of effort to push the price down and the price actually follow it. This would mean that institutions no longer support the price, they're no longer buyers, they're sellers. And therefore we need to get out of this position if we're long-term investors and maybe establish even sh some short-term positions to the downside. All right, another trade, another anatomy of the trade. So this is a current position but this is a very interesting position because actually there were quite a lot of you know calls and trades in this position, uh, Nova Deer, uh, and uh, we've been actually trading this stock together with students in the Wyckoff Market Discussion class. We do that throughout different classes. Different classes have you know different trades that we are doing in the uh, in real time. So. This was the first call to get in, <coughs> excuse me, into Novadir 
on this particular bar, on the reversal bar, after the attempt to spring and after the higher low test on the lower supply signature. We actually brought this up into the class and we've been training that. Next entry, next entry, next entry, next entry. So as the trend and upswing develops, we are uh, coming in into the position after the reaction. This is our methodology. This is our systematic approach as to how we would trade. And then COVID reaction was very favorable for Navadir on the relative basis. There is no break in the relative performance. Uh, the relative strength stays above the moving average. And even on the comparative basis and on structural basis, after the major sign of strength, um, we are only coming to the high, to the level of the resistance, and then quickly recovering off that. So that shows a lot of strength. So where are the current points of entry? Here, 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 and here. Again, um, what we're doing here is after our analysis and our selection, we want to establish a very systematic way of how we increase the position based on the confirmation of the trend. And that's exactly what we've done here. Actually, this is probably one of the best trades for this year uh, on the recovery. And what we're expecting here is within the uptrend, you know, you see this up channel, we want to the price to probably overcome 550 and we are so close to that. Uh, and to show us an overbought, overthrown condition. And this would be the time, uh, you know, to scale out or to close a position, depending on your time horizon. Um, and something that um, I'm looking forward to doing, you know, uh, once it happens. So um, multiple trades, two, tr two major trades, multiple entries, multiple exits. By the way, the exit here was also extremely well-timed. Again, this climactic action uh, that is happening again, and that's why you know I'm waiting for it to develop a little bit more. Um, the exit was right on the way down, just because of the climax itself and of the next reversal that came on the increased volume signature. So you could see how institutions are selling on the way up and also selling on the way down. Uh, a question from John is Novadir outperforming the NTX. Well, you will have to put NDX right here. So uh, in my work, I usually uh, uh, SPX is because it's more of the institutional guideline, you know, they uh, use the uh, uh, S&P 500 for their performance assessment. So I usually have those, but you definitely can do this, John, on your own. Just put here at NASDAQ and the accent, and you could see uh, what another deer is doing, you know, relative to NASDAQ itself. All right. Um, how do we at Wyckoff Analytics provide our students uh, with, uh, you know, skill building? exercises one of them obviously you know during the class we go through a lot of exercises and we discuss a lot of charts it's essential to have those discussions because um you need to have a feedback right away and we need to understand where we are making the mistakes and how to correct them so discussion interaction with students is very crucial but you could also uh, develop your visual recognition skill of like of concepts through other different venues that we have. One of them is a bias game. So we play the bias game on Twitter. Go to our handle at like of analysis and you will find that game. Uh, we usually post a, an assignment chart. Then you guys vote as to, you know, this is what bias this is, accumulation or distribution. And then we study the solution, we give you the solution where we have the Wyckoff story, uh, we have the, uh, obviously the answer, we have the labeling and we have some annotations. This is a very, very popular game uh, with students and a lot of them just follow this game religiously. On the weekly basis, we post the new charts. So 
uh, whether you're going to take this course or not, I would highly recommend follow, uh, to follow this game uh, and to start on a weekly basis acquiring the practice of just going through the chart, going through the supply and demand, going through the price and volume relationship, going through a like of label it, and identifying you know those correctly and then receiving the feedback from us and seeing exactly you know what you missed or uh, how well you did. All right, I mentioned that we have uh, three main classes and uh, everything else is on demand and you know specials. Our third class is the weekly Wyckoff market discussion. This class I conduct with Bruce Frazier and Bruce uh, has been uh, a Wyckoffian for quite some time together with Hank. They've developed their original uh, curriculum uh, for Wyckoff classes at Golden Gate University. I'm so happy uh, and thrilled you know, to teach together with Bruce. He's been a longtime teacher um, and I've learned a lot from him and from Hank throughout the years. So uh, this is probably one of the most interesting classes during the week that we have because it's all about application. We don't go into the theory, we don't go into the explanation, we just put on the charts of the current markets and we just basically go into the reviews, like of labeling, uh, historical analogs, we go through the stock selection uh, with the top-down approach, uh, we talk about the trade candidates uh, and so on and so forth. And then we have all the different sections there. I've mentioned, you know, uh, scanning. I've mentioned anatomy of the trade. I mentioned student submission of the charts and we comment on their work from, uh, from time to time. Uh, and also just, you know, asking what stocks you would like to look at. Um, so I would highly recommend this class and just you know check it out on our website. There's going to be a free session this week on September 2nd at 3 p.m. Pacific, and you can register on our wikofanalytics.com. All right, so I think that we still have some time. So for those of you who are interested of going through the anatomy of the COVID decline and the current rally, we'll definitely do that. For those of you who are going to log off at this point, uh, well, first of all, I would be uh, extremely happy, you know, to uh, work with you in the fall semester uh, on wake of concepts and on a recognition of those concepts. Um, so I'm looking forward to having you on our roster. Go register. Uh, for those of you who are already students, uh, let's get work. Uh, let's get working on our homeworks. Our first homework, and Jonathan is asking, uh, home, what is the homework for this week? I've mentioned that the homework for the week was the Anatomy of the Trade article by Jim Forte. You will be able to download it from our website. You can actually find it in the free resources uh, page, but also I will put this article uh, um, on the uh, class page that you will be able to access after we send you the instruction tonight. Okay, so uh, with that, let's look at the how did we go through the COVID reaction? Well, first of all, before we actually, uh, you know, go into the reaction itself, uh, what preceded it? This is a PNF chart of the S&P 500, and we're seeing this 2017 climactic run, stop in action in 2018, and then development of the trading range into the December 24th low uh, in phase C, which acted as a shakeout at that point of time. And we were so, uh, you know, correct on the recovery. It kind of reminds me of how COVID recovery has happened as well. So it was very interesting to observe a lot of people just saying that, you know, it cannot go to the same high, whereas our point uh, in figure uh, uh, targets were just showing 4,000 on the S&P, 3,000 on the S&P. So it was hard to believe, but you have to follow, you know, the methodology. And then as the price goes up, you kind of have confirmation after the confirmation. So in 2019, we, we were, you know, uh, making a lot of good calls. And um, after this 
backing up action in the trading range, we've confirmed our original count uh, that uh, was showing us uh, around 3,500. Uh, it was confirmed by this backing up uh, action trading range, and that suggested that we're still gonna go up. We're still gonna go higher. And indeed we did. And uh, at that time I was using also, um, you know, price structural analogs. I really love doing this because the, uh, in my opinion, the market participants' behaviors repeat themselves. We really don't change as people in the way how we behave. So uh, the market um, is kind of like multiple herds of strong and weak hands, and you know their uh, behaviors is very much unconscious, uh, whether profitable or very much unconscious unprofitable behavior. So and that's why you're going to see this type of you know climactic runs that are going to conclude uh, with some kind of reaction, change of behavior, absorption that will lead into the rally. Uh, with the up thrust overthrow, and then with the reaction into phase C. Uncanny how it happened, how it repeated itself. So in this analog in 1998-99, suggested that we are actually going to have a very robust rally. We have. It didn't overcome this high, which suggested that the last leg up will not be as extensive. But look at this uh, upslope in trading range that lasted for nine months. Well, in January, we started our, you know, uh, actually in October here, we started the run up um, and uh, uh, the formation also was up sloping. So if you would combine analog work with like of, you know, structural work, it will make a lot of sense. As the price was going up, uh, we were trying to find, you know, and catch the uh, the top, and uh, this is the actual tweet on uh, February 22nd, and we're just basically saying that the markets are showing vulnerability and change of behavior. Um, the downward spread volume and supply signature have increased, and therefore we are identifying this as the potential beginning of the potential decline of the potential change of behavior. Our potential short-term target on NASDAQ and the NDX was here. So we're saying that the first leg down is going to be reminiscent to what we've seen here. And then we're either going to go into a trading range or we're going to go into some kind of more meaningful reaction. Well, that was the actual call. And that was actually, you know, a very uh, good call. I, uh, actually had trades just based on that call. And then at the end of the COVID reaction, this is S&P, E-minus, uh, uh, two hour chart, uh, you know, to have the whole structure. This was the weekend before the final low. And the idea here, the analysis was showing that we are in the trading range, but we could have either a spring situation which is the lower low that recovers really fast, or we could have a more meaningful capitulation that would lead to the final general selling climax. Uh, so the best case scenario and the worst case scenario. And the best case scenario materialized. So you kind of could see when you build up the scenarios and then the price and the market is doing exactly, you know, like one of the scenarios is showing you, you're gonna have a mental strength and an emotional strength to follow that scenario. So what has happened on the intraday basis? This was the day of the reversal. And this is again, was the tweet on that particular day. And I remember very clearly that March 23rd um, day when after the weekend, we had a gap down, but the price during the Asian and um, uh, European uh, sessions actually was not going down. Something was different. The behavior has changed. And we as white confidants want to observe that behavior. And just to say that, you know, the way how it behaves, it behaves more bullish than bearish. And then before the US market, we had a very, very strong rally. This was one of the best intraday rallies that we have had on the way down. So 
that also showed their bullish aggressiveness, uh, a, a bullish aggression, and uh, suggested that we're in a different environment. Well, we needed to be uh, uh, sure that on this day, we're going to have the actual reversal. First leg down, high or low. Next leg down, still high or low. And holding that overnight support, which becomes a bullish indication. And then high or low from there, high or low from there. And look at this reaction. It's flatter than the previous reactions that we have seen. This is where confirmation after confirmation during the March 23rd day, and again, I was just commenting literally hour by hour, um, was showing a lot of bullish behavior. And this is how we identified the actual day of the reversal. Now, having said this, I've been buying the market before March 23rd because of some of the signs that I've seen in some of the stocks. So, and this is something that, you know, needs a little bit more uh, of the attention. But, um, you know, to show you exactly, you know, what was going on, actually the first signs of buying came on the preliminary support on this volume signature on this rally right here. It was very subtle and obviously for a maturistic eye, it would be very, very hard to see. But this was the first time well, that we've identified that some buying has happened. Then a really good rally here into the announcement of the national emergency. And then a bunch of other uh, stuff that came technically that we could talk about. In phase B, testing action was very favorable. This was into the Gavin Newsom announcement, uh, a small upthrust that reversed. And then obviously March 23rd and then confirmation of March 24th, that was the key. Um, so as you could see, and I always tell my students that change happens gradually. They cannot come in and just buy, 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 and reverse, reverse, reverse. It's going to happen gradually that they are starting to buy certain stocks that they think that have value and that uh, potential leadership stocks into the future. And that's what starts to gradually stop price from moving more aggressively to the downside. And then once the herd of smart money, you know, uh, consistently uh, do this throughout days and days and days, and it took here, you know, uh, 12 days, uh, a short time for accumulation, if we would be thinking about, you know, other periods of their accumulation, but uh, quite some time to produce a V bottom type of accumulation. Um, so from our perspective, as we build up on the confirmations and evidence and deductions that the environment changes, we could go into the selection and figure out the stocks that we would be buying. And here it is a little bit more. So preliminary buying uh, at the beginning of the trading range, uh, then more buying in this area right here, buying on the way up, especially right here, final absorption, absorption on the way up, and then vertical absorption as we go through the multiple levels of the resistance. Um, and that was the way for us to identify both the top uh, of the COVID reaction and the bottom of the COVID reaction. All right, well, uh, it, the, we are almost at the end of our session. Wow, I went really fast. So I'm really happy that, you know, I'm not actually holding you off until, you know, 5.30. So again, for students who already signed up or for those of you who will sign up for our course, our first homework is gonna be the uh, uh, James Forte's Anatomy of the Trading Range article. Uh, please read it for next week. Uh, we're not going to necessarily discuss it, but there will be some schematics that, would, that we will use from there. Um, so I want you to make sure that you understand not only schematics, but what that schematic actually means. And specific attention uh, is to the Wyckoff phases and Wyckoff events in the trading range. So please pay attention to that. Um, I've mentioned that we have a fully developed educational curriculum uh, at wikofanalytics.com. For those of you who are not going to be taking Wyckoff trading course, you know, 
uh, consider a weekly white of market discussion or any type of on-demand courses uh, that you know uh, is going to be of interest to you we have quite a few and uh, just to remind you if you still would like to attend next two complimentary uh, sessions uh, they are going to start at 3 p.m pacific tomorrow and on wednesday so we would be very thrilled if you could join us for that and again you know for those of you who are thinking about signing up for like uh, uh part one course uh, go to our website find that uh, like of trading course uh, life class part one sign up if you have any questions like of associates at gmail.com um, also consider the payment plan uh, two hundred fifty dollars per month and then here is our schedule and we'll talk more about the homeworks and how we're gonna work with students so it's all gonna be discussed uh, later on all right, uh, let's see if we have any questions. Jonathan is asking, do we send notes? Uh, Jonathan, what notes are we talking about? Homeworks? Yes, absolutely. You will be sending me, email me uh, your homeworks. I will be going through all of them. I will be making short comments and then we also will be doing the review of the homeworks in the next class. So that's the usual way of how we deal with the homeworks. Um, is it gonna be recorded? Yes, this session is recorded uh, and we're gonna upload it to YouTube and tonight it's gonna be available. Uh, so at some point uh, for sure, uh, check it out. From Steven, can we apply this methods to Forex pairs? Absolutely, this is a great question. Thank you, Steven. And there are quite a lot of Forex traders that come our way, cryptocurrency traders that come our way. Where you have the price structure, you could apply Wyckoff, um, uh, Wyckoff methodology. Um, so uh, therefore, uh, you know, uh, I usually comment to on Forex trading that, and I've been actually a Forex trader for quite some time when I was younger, you know, for five, seven years I've traded Forex. Uh, it's just, you know, a little bit hard uh, being on the West Coast here in the US, uh, just because everything happens at night. Um, so it was not the best, uh, but uh, definitely price structural analysis, comparative analysis, uh, tactical uh, trade management analysis, all of that you could definitely use. What specific indicators uh, make you think tomorrow is a pause? Um, uh, from Michael, not necessarily I'm saying that tomorrow is a pause, I'm just saying that we are in the area where the pause could happen. And uh, I'm not using any indicators, I'm just using a, a pure price volume relationship. Uh, trend identification and so on and so forth. Okay, uh, WB, not sure what's the question here. Where's the point of entry? Well, I mean, we, we have to look at the specific chart. Uh, from Bruce, can we consider the major indices to be in terminal stage and of phase D? Um, yes, we're definitely in some kind of climactic run, Bruce, and that's why I'm saying that uh, we are in the uh, area where um, a potential pause reversal could happen. Now, climactic runs are very uh, tricky because they could run for some time. So you have to know how to time the reversal itself. If we indeed gonna have some kind of reversal, I would say that this is the conclusion of the climactic run. So far, we have not had the reversal yet. So therefore, we're just looking uh, for that. Uh, next question um, from Killier. I'm a veteran. Does Wyckoff Analytics offer military discount for their courses? Um, a great question, and thank you so much for for your service, Killier. Um, so please write us an email, um, and Nancy, you could definitely take care of that, and you know we'll have some kind of discount. So please just write us uh, from. Alexis, okay, if strong hands, composite operator is looking for volatility to enter the market, weak hands on wrong position. On weak hands, the ones that create the market conditions for a reversal. On TCO types, trying to find places where weak hands are showing up to 
um, unload or accumulate the position. So uh, strong hands are going to come in into the position uh, where uh, they think that there is some value and there is liquidity. Uh, the liquidity is going to be uh, created by weak hands capitulation. So therefore, weak hands are not really trying to reverse the direction of the downtrend. They are capitulating. They are giving up on their positions. And as they give up, they sell their positions. That's what produces that climactic run. On the upside, climactic runs or malt ups also going to have the same type of attributes. This is where weak hands are given up on not coming in into the position and they come in in bunches and with the whole size. And this is where the strong hands composite man is going to sell into that, uh, into that run. Uh, Bruce is asking a follow-up question. What are we looking for to see the reversal? Okay, well, let's uh, quickly, you know, as long as we are. Um, so reversal is going to be something where the last commitment to the upside, like this bar right here, has been reversed by a bar that is going to close below that level. Well, this is obviously an extreme, but let's say that if we are looking at the last two bars here to the upside, and this is the commitment, this is the next commitment, we should see the reversal that's going to close below those levels. And that's how we would identify that type of stop in action, a possible just pause, uh, something like this. Uh, so it's a multi-stage process, you know, as to how we identify, uh, you know, whether there's going to be just um, a small pause, a small reaction, or there's going to be a much more meaningful reaction. Uh, Terence is asking, do you teach how to read the chart bar by bar? Uh, absolutely. Actually, you know, uh, and let's just go to our curriculum. In the second portion of the course under the supply and demand, we will do tape reading techniques, bar by bar, swing by swing, volume and price analysis, effort versus result, all of those are tape reading techniques. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, this is my favorite subject. So uh, I go into a lot of depth and we do a lot of exercises on that. And this skill of tape reading, you know, is pretty consistent in the way how we develop uh, with our students. All right, what else? Um, uh, from Cohen, is it possible to try for the first installment and uh, if for some reason not able to continue or decided to stop, not able to continue to end the course? Um, yes, sure, uh, not preferable, but I mean, uh, obviously, if you know, if you're not satisfied, we're not going to force you. Um, so just email nancy at wikeofassociates at gmail.com and she could answer this question in more details. Uh, from Heime, uh, how do modern market forces like dark pools and high frequency trading affect the Wyckoff analysis methodology? Yeah, interesting question and a lot of people ask this question. You know, um, my answer to this is always this. High frequency trading is very beneficial to the market. Yes, in some instances it could produce some undesirable volatility. But at the same time, if you think about the definition of high frequency trading, that's what allows a lot of big institutions to have the liquidity events, you know, to come in and to get out of the positions. Um, so it's, a, it's kind of like a necessary evil that we have to have. And it actually, you know, quite, uh, quite desirable. Um, does it influence Wyckoff analysis methodology? Not necessarily. The structure is still going to behave the same way. So let's say that high frequency traders, uh, like on, um, uh, like in the flash crash of 2010, uh, March 6, uh, May 6, right? Uh, March 6 or May 6, I already forgot, produced that big spike to the downside. What did happen at the end of that spike? Big institutions, knowing that cyclicality is still in place and we're still in a 
big, a much larger secular price cycle, they came in and they bought because they had both value and liquidity at the same time. So in a way, they benefited, you know, from that high frequency trading. Uh, in terms of the dog pools, uh, the ones that, you know, are being kind of advertised as like big uh, size on the tape, uh, those are actually beneficial to us as well. Why? Because if we see big orders and we see in what direction that order is and we see what kind of price effect that order has had and we see that there are multiple big orders like that, then most likely we're going to understand what the bias is and what the timing is. So both of those dark pools and high frequency trading do not change our analysis, but actually help us to understand, you know, the price structure better. Terence is asking, if you are a veteran, who do you contact? Well, Terence and uh, Kilian, again, you know, thank you for your services. And please do contact Nancy at Associates at uh, gmail.com. And we'll be glad to take care of that. Um, Gaurav is asking, what does secular mean in the context of a trend? So usually when we talk about secular moves, we would be talking about, you know, big moves that unfold for years and years and years. And this example right here, uh, Apple monthly chart, the secular causality is being resolved in the secular effect. So this intense accumulation first in the trading range and then on the first two legs up by institutions are still uh, producing the effect, secular effect, where the price is still going up and up and up. So we're talking about, uh, uh, you know, multiple years. And then cyclical is going to be just a smaller uh, business cycle type of moves where they could last, you know, from two to maybe five, six years type of moves. All right. Uh, will you answer questions in YouTube replay? Uh, missed the first hour. Yeah, uh, well, absolutely. There were some questions, um, um, not a lot. I was trying to cover the whole material, but uh, please do watch, the, you know, uh, the video on YouTube, and uh, um, hopefully your answers will be uh, answered. What else? There were a couple of questions before that I might have missed. Uh, WB is asking about silver, so we've discussed silver. I actually was showing in the anatomy of the trade as silver trade. Let me just capture this. Yes, here it is. So just come back, you know, on the video to this slide. So silver is in the uh, cyclical secular move, um, you know, just because it went from uh, 11 to 27, that is significant in also overcoming the previous highs. Uh, so I would be expecting a, uh, some pause or continuation, doesn't really matter, but, you know, uh, we're conducting the campaign right there. Okay, uh, let me see um, previous questions. Okay. Uh, do you hedge, buy and sell at the same time? So um, buying and selling at the same time is not necessarily a hedge. Um, buying and selling at the same time, you know, um, is pair trading, uh, spread trading. Um, so you could read on that, you know, just Google that. Uh, by hedging, what do I mean? It means that I'm conducting a campaign a long-term campaign and the price, let's say, came into the oversold, overbought condition. So for instance, I mentioned that in silver, I scaled out a little bit of the overall position that was acquired at the lower prices. Why? Because we're in the overbought condition. Um, so scaling out is not hedging, but you know, what would be the hedge? I could uh, look at the 
reverse ETF uh, and establish some kind of position in that ETF. So buy that ETF at let's say around 27. And that would be my hedge against the main position. So that's what I mean by a hedge. Okay, let me see what else we have here. Okay, what is a sign of strength? Strength signal? Um, yes, a sign of strength is just a rally that is different rally than anything what we've seen before in the trading range. We will be studying this in more details uh, in, the, uh, in the class. Kaylin is asking, do you use the system to trade option? Uh, absolutely. Um, uh, you know, I actually kind of trade everything right now. Um, I don't see any particular um, edge in any particular instrument or time frame. This is the time in the market where all of the time frames are working, whether you are a long-term companion, whether you are a swing trading, whether you are intraday trading. And I don't discriminate any instruments right now. Um, I have cash positions. I have options positions. Um, you know, from time to time, I open futures positions. You just have to recognize, first of all, who you are. And I know who I am as a trader. I'm a speculator. As a speculator, I'm not speculating in a single instrument or a single time frame. I speculate in opportunities, whether they are, you know, on the intraday or on the long term a term time frame and I speculate with different instruments and that's kind of like my uh, philosophy right now around trading but you have to get there I mean like you have to really really be knowledgeable about you know what you do um, okay uh, sign of strength is uh, is sign of strength a change of behavior that's a follow-up question from Bruce yes it is, and that's the short answer, but then for the longer answer and for more detailed answer, Bruce, uh, let's discuss this in the class. Uh, Jonathan is asking, will you be teaching us how to hedge? Um, not in part one, because part one has a lot of knowledge that is more uh, fundamental intermediate knowledge and I want all of my students to get on the same page we really really need to um, get the basics right I mean a lot of people come to me and they say or oh, I've read this book on Wyckoff I've I've studied with this Wyckoff teacher and then you know I put the chart in front of them and they can't really you know follow all of the things that we discuss in part in Wyckoff trading course part one so um, I've stopped, you know, accepting students into part two without, you know, the prerequisite of part one, just because um, people are not at the level that I want. And, uh, you know, as you will know, I'm kind of like a very strict teacher. So even though, um, you know, I say that you could be an observer, you don't have to participate at all in a class and you still can be there. Uh, but for those of you who have, you know, higher goals and you want to interact, you know, I'm going to be asking a lot of you uh, from you. You know, I'm going to be asking you to remember a lot of the things. I'm going to be asking you to remember how to correctly observe certain events on the chart. I'm going to be asking you for the correct uh, uh, way of deducting what those observations are. All right, a couple of more last questions and then we're going to go. Do you teach futures? And here is the thing with Wyckoff methodology. So Wyckoff methodology could be applied to any instrument, whether it's stocks, futures, forex, Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies, and so on and so forth. So this question probably, uh, you know, um, is very common. Um, you know, uh, can you do this? Could you teach this? Could you teach that? But what we are teaching is we are teaching a fundamental way of how to analyze any of the instruments that you guys trade using the Wyckoff analysis. So therefore, uh, you know, um, it doesn't really matter whether it's futures stocks or anything else. Okay, so some uh, questions on silver and thoughts from WB. Um, so I would 
advised to come to Wednesday class. This is where we're going to go through so many charts and we're going to go through so many markets. So it would be just a much easier way of going through this. All right. Okay, I think that's it. Uh, I definitely have missed some of the questions. There, there were quite a few. So, but it's 5:30 uh, uh, on the Pacific Coast, so we're gonna stop uh, here. First of all, I just want to say thank you so much for attending this free session. Again, you can catch this session um, on our YouTube channel probably in a couple of hours. Um, and then, if you have any other question, don't hesitate to contact us at wikofassociates at gmail dot com. To register for this course, uh, go to wikofanalytics dot com. Wikof Trading Course WTC Part One. Um, and uh, I'm looking forward to working with you. Let's get back. It's September. The school year has started, so uh, we're gonna start as well um, throughout the first fifteen sessions. You're going to receive a lot of information. I'm looking forward to um, kind of having a really good uh, group of traders that have high, uh, higher, you know, standards for themselves um, in terms of learning the material. I don't care whether you are a beginner or an intermediate trader. If you're going to work on this material, I guarantee you that you're going to feel that your analysis improves. Not necessarily execution, uh, but your analysis will definitely improve. And then hopefully with part number two, your execution will start improving as well. So thank you so much. And um, I'll see you in classes. Thank you, guys. And bye-bye.